Growth Pod is brought to you by Genero, a leading growth agency in the Nordics. We interview marketing experts, business leaders, and entrepreneurs to uncover the stories and strategies behind profitable growth. Today's guest is Said Esmail Sada. He's a scientist with a PhD in inorganic chemistry, a serial entrepreneur who has co-founded, managed, and invested in over 30 technology companies. So my, my, many more than we can count a uh, list here on, on the show. Uh, he's currently serving as founder and CEO of Ehab Ismail Sade Holding, uh, which is a multinational company with a, gr- a group uh, with a net asset value of around 8 billion Swedish krona. Said, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. So you have a quite unusual background, I think, for someone who's an entrepreneur um, and an investor. Uh, you started off studying chemistry. So I'd be curious, what is it that first got you into the sciences and, and doing research? Uh, I don't know, really. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I was, I, I've always been interested in, you know, reading books and, you know, since I was a kid and, and, and uh, kind of, you know, could mm, been very nerdy in uh, finding something and really digging into it. And, um, so, uh, uh, and when I st- well, uh, when I uh, when I w- was going to university, you know, I could have been mathematics or actually law was something that uh, I was interested in, and chemistry. So it was a variety of different uh, disciplines that I was interested in. For some reason, you know, I think it was the you know the the, the experimental part of chemistry that really interested me. Uh, so I was accepted to lots of different universities and different, uh, uh, sectors, but, uh, I chose to, to, to do chemistry, uh, which I think, uh, helped me a lot in, you know, structuring and understanding more of the empirical nature of, uh, of science. So you obviously did really well. You eventually, you got your PhD. What made you then decide to go into business, leaving academia research and going into business? Yeah, I think it, uh, well, first of all, uh, I've always been interested in building something, you know, creating, building, and also, you know, as a researcher, it is, it, to some to some degree, it's very much, you know, you have to be entrepreneurial in, to be, in, in order to be a successful researcher because you can't do it alone. So you have to build your own research group. You have to recruit talented people. You have to get uh, financing for that, uh, and so on. So, so, uh, so I was interested in building already, you know, as a researcher, and perhaps even before that. But becoming entrepreneur and setting up businesses was not, you know, something that came to me naturally. So uh, I, I had a friend, Ashkan Puya, that. Uh, uh, was more, you know, he went to business schools and wanted to start his own company. And uh, so together we, it was a good match. And uh, yeah, that's where my entrepreneurial career started about 20 years back now. So you had this kind of classic Silicon Valley type where you had a technical founder being you, and then you had like the business person. Yeah, you and could say that. It seemed to work really well. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. So, yeah. So the first venture, uh, which was like Diamorph and, and Serendipity, those were uh, really successful. Uh, most companies, I think most people who start in business, they have some failures, but it seems like, I'm sure you guys, guys had failures along the way, but it seemed like you were able to be really successful from the start. Um, not really. Would you say that's the case? <laughs> no, not okay. really. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I'm used to fail. Uh, and you know, I get, sometimes I get a question. Okay, can you uh, can you mention one of your failures? But you know, there are so many. Uh, and uh, the thing is that since you know, being in you know, in in order to uh, building something new, uh, you have to be prepared for failures. And since I'm failing so much in what I do. I have to do it in a structured way. I have to do it in a, you know, with some systematic, so that it doesn't break you. You know, it's it. 
getting back to chemistry, you know, that uh, it's okay, you know, to fail. Most experiments fail, you know, but you have to do it in a controlled manner so that when it fails, it doesn't totally, you know, you get you don't get a big explosion and you <laughs> people get hurt, you know. So you have to do it in a controlled way. You have to do it in a small manner so that you know that, okay, you, it's not a huge investment that we have put into this. So if it fails, let it fail small. So we, you know, we put lots of pressure on, on the, you know, the, the, the seed so that we know, will it going to, is it going to attract some customers? And when we get the few customers and then getting things rolling, so that so that we don't pump in lots of you know we don't lots of uh, investments and suddenly you know everything <laughs> you know goes south so um so it's more working really with uh, systematic in how to fail uh that's the key to success so it sounds like you took this you took all the lessons of how to do it, effective science like in chemistry the looking for imp- the empirical process and failing but doing it in controlled manner. So you applied it to business. Yes, exactly. I, I would say uh, being empirical in your approach, uh, I mean, I'm not a very super smart, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a genius in any way. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm okay <laughs> in my cognitive, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, functions, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, definitely not a genius. And you don't need to be it. That's the thing with being empirical process, you know, in the same way as uh, you don't have to be super smart, uh, super intelligent to get information about maybe, you know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, then maybe you needed to be super smart to have lots of internet information stored, okay, in, in the brain. Today, you don't need it because you have the tool, you take your smartphone and you can get the information directly, okay? So you can be average, but you suddenly the phone makes you, you know, to another level, takes you to another level. In the same way, empirical processes is that you can be average, but if you apply it in a systematic way, uh, in a structured systematic way, it can take you from average to very high level. And that is what I am doing all the time. So this ties on something that I was going to talk about later, but let's go to it right now. I think um, you've had this concept of a no bullshit policy, <laughs> which I would love if you could explain what it means to you personally and why it's important for business. Because my reading is that that comes from your scientific background mm-hmm. and that you recognize that being open-minded, being self-critical, always being introspective is actually a huge competitive advantage yeah. in business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd love if you could talk about that. Yeah, sure. I, uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, so <laughs> no bullshit policy. You know, so uh, I uh, uh, last few years I've been thinking, how come I've been success- uh, successful in what I've been doing? Relatively successful, at least. And um, I'm 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 all the times, you know, recruiting and hiring people that are more intelligent than I am, and they are more hardworking than I am. So. So, so how come they don't recruit, they don't hire me? You know, how come they are not more successful than me? So what's the reason? And I've been thinking and thinking, and I think, I, and I've been landing into it. It is my, what I call the no bullshit policy. And what is it? It means that, you know, it is having two very different approaches at the same time. So it is that... Um, so it's uh, being very open-minded towards new ideas that are coming in and whatever crazy ideas that are coming being compassionate inquiry you know trying to really you know what are you, what is it that you are saying really i i i want i'm interested i'm i want to understand i want to understand what you are saying i want to understand the, this you know whatever crazy idea you might come. I'm in, I'm intrigued. I want to hear <laughs> what you're talking about. Okay. At the same time, being very critical to what you are saying. Okay. Hmm. 
let let us go deep into what you said here, asking some more questions and find out whether it is, you know, it's some substance to it or it's just bullshit, okay? That's the very short version of it. You can read more about the policy document on our website. So <laughs> uh, it is, you know, how to, uh, we have been structured in how to, you know, approach new ideas and being open-minded, but at the same time start, you know, your inquiry in order to understand, but also in order to critically, you know, putting some questions, question marks to it. Uh, and uh, if I give you an example, you know, I, I was meeting, you know, this was a few months ago, a CEO of a Swedish company. And I usually, I, I use it actually as a, my kind of, uh, you know, test, testing, you know, and seeing, you know, pushing and seeing if people have, how, uh, how do you say, how, uh, uh, how much they really think about, you know, the ideas that the concepts that they have in their, in their head, uh, or is it just just they throw out something and they don't think about it and they don't care about? It? And we were uh, so I I asked him, do you think it's important with the, uh, you know, the climate, climate issue, climate problem, you know, uh, and uh, what everybody is talking about and everybody is having is uh, worried about and so on. And he said that, yeah, I think it's very important. And I said, okay, how important is it? Uh, I mean, how would how would you rank it? And he was like, well, it's the most important, probably the most important issue for mankind and for our survival. You know, it's some serious statements. It's the most important issue for mankind and, and the survival of humanity you know, it's thing is quite serious. And then my question was, okay, how many hours a week do you study it? Well, <laughs> well, I didn't study it that much. And what are you doing about it? You know, well, he had an electrical car, you know. Uh, so, you know, that is bullshit for me. Okay, and then I ask him, okay, so why do you think it is important? And he said, well, because of carbon dioxide. I said, okay, what about carbon dioxide? Well, it's toxic. No, carbon dioxide is not toxic. You know, so people have some concepts of things. They believe in something. They are very opinionated, but it's just bullshit, you know? And that is my no bullshit policy in just, you know, to uh, forcing his hands. And saying, come on, if it if this was really something that you believed is, you know, the most critical, important thing for mankind, and it is, you know, our the survival of humanity depends on it, the survival of your kids depends on it. Me for sure, if I believed it, I would sit and study it. You know? I would sit down and I would read about it and I would dig into it because my dot if my daughter's survival depended on it hell i would sit and read about it okay but people don't and i would say it's uh, you know that that's 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 what i say you know kind of you know having a no bullshit policy and i don't take bullshit uh you know people can live with bullshit if they want i don't uh, i want to live the world i want to understand my world and i want to understand my world the way it is and I don't want to build up some fake, you know, wishful thinking kind of worlds, you know. So, uh, yeah. As I think this policy, like this attitude has probably helped you a lot in science, but also in business when it comes to investing, because you have to ask, you ask yourself really tough questions. Yes. And you're, you know, fine man, Richard Feynman had this quote about you shouldn't fool anyone. And you're the easiest person to fool. So you really <laughs> have to like, but I'd love to, to dive into this a little bit um obviously one part of it is personality like some people are much more geared towards first principles thinking and wanting to understand but there's also a part of it that maybe can be systematized into an organization so one example amazon famously rejected all powerpoints because bezos felt that if you have to write it down you have to be much more critical and clear in your thinking mm -hmm. so are you trying to systemize in your group of companies somehow 
this way of approaching the world. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. How, how do you go about that? So uh, I work a lot with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with researchers and people in academia. So we have uh, uh, Yuan Yardebu that I work uh, with uh, since, uh, you know, since this summer. Uh, speci- specifically on this no bullshit policy, you know, and uh, and um, his uh, his research is uh, uh, he is at Cambridge, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he's a historian. Historian, he's a historian. It's uh, well, I don't know what it is in English exactly that discipline, but anyway, uh, and. Uh, so he, 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 for example, we have workshops, seminars. Uh, we invite different people uh, with, uh, uh, with different uh, ideas within a certain uh, topic, uh, whether it's climate, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, equality, whether it's uh, what, what, what does it mean with social responsibility? What does it mean with... Uh, what is the responsibility of a ser- us as business owner or what is our, you know, this kind of, so we have this kind of uh, seminars and workshops uh, where we, uh, together with uh, employees in in the company and uh, our portfolio uh, in order to set the, how do you say, to have an, you know, the, the combining these two, you know, being very open-minded to new ideas at the same time being very critical and putting the question marks. Uh, I think it's uh, it's good to be open-minded. That is, I think it's this quote from Groucho Marx that uh, uh, it's good to be open-minded, but not that uh, not 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 that much so that your brain falls out. So uh, <laughs> it's good also to you know critically, you know. Uh, uh, scrutinizing uh, ideas. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, when we were kids and uh, when you were a kid and you asked your dad, dad, why are cars, why are they moving like, you know, uh, on the roads? And say, well, because they have four wheels. Uh, uh, yeah, but why? Well, because you need to have four wheels to be stable and moving forward. But why? You know, you ask the question why, usually if you ask it three times, then you get to core of a certain thing. And somehow we lost it on the way, you know. So we have to go back and being a kid again and asking these questions to ourselves and, you know, to other people. Why? Why and why? And then you then you have some very interest, I promise you, Try that and you will see. You will have some very interesting discussions then. So that seems like to, to the companies that you invest in or, or acquire, teaching them this model of problem solving or, you know, trying to find the truth essentially um, is one of the values that you add or one of the value add functions that you have. But what else, what else is it um, that you add as a holding company to the companies that you invest in, like why do you think that? Why, why basically, why do companies decide or should decide to sell to you? Like, uh, what are the things that you so are I able think, to add? Uh, for well, uh, I'm 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 a libertarian, <laughs> so I believe you know. I should be able to do what whatever I want to do. You should be able to do whatever I want to do, as long as I don't harm you. As long as you don't harm me, you know, just do your stuff, and I will do my stuff. So. And I believe that there is a huge potential in each and every individual if you have a good platform, if you have a good vessel for that individual to grow. And that is what we try to provide. Um, I don't say that we are the best in doing that, but that is our approach and that is what to, uh, I think. So what we do is that w- when we acquire, for example, a business, for us, it's very, very important to really acquire and invest in the best of the best. It's always profitable businesses. It's businesses that have been growing rather stable. It doesn't need to be, you know, this uh, hockey stick, uh, uh, but, you know, stable growth somehow. And uh, But uh, but rely- reliable and consistent cash flow and profitability. 
and this is some that is something that is important for us. So when we acquire something, we do it because they are the best of the best. Okay. And what we say to them is that, you know, guys, usually it's guys, sometimes girls, but usually guys, uh, we want you to just continue to do whatever you do. And probably there are some steps that you haven't been taking. For example, we acquired a business in Spain, excellent business, sauce business, 100% uh, uh, recurrent revenue, license fees, uh, only sold in Spain. Okay. And when we dig into it rather quickly, you will find out that, well, the entrepreneur and the CEO, which was the same the, then, Spanish guy that speaks only Spanish. You know, then you have a natural threshold why he doesn't go to Germany and why he doesn't go to UK or Nordics. Okay. But that is something that we can add. Okay. Excellent, excellent uh, uh, products and services that they uh, they are distributing. So, so, I, uh, so, so that is what we tell them that you, what you do is excellent. It's perfect. Just continue doing that. And now we can add some more things to that, to the tool that you have. For example, we can take it to take your business to different countries or whatever you need. Maybe they, sometimes they, they have their rather small, medium sized businesses. They have difficulties in recruiting talents, but in a bigger you know, platform, then it's easier for us to recruit talents and so. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, but very, uh, it's a non, it's a, it's a non-invasive managerial approach. So we don't change the name of the brand. We don't change the, and the, most of these companies, they are run more or less like a family, you know, so if someone comes and say, oh, we're going to move your production from here to, I don't know to uh, to Portugal from uh, from Finland because it's cheaper. You know we don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, so we it's not, and I don't say it's bad to do that. It's just not our approach. Our approach is that finding the best of the best, letting them continue, and keeping the entrepreneurial spirit in the business. So. It seems to have been really successful for you. You've grown uh, net as net as value, for instance, hugely in the last couple of years. Um, a big piece to making that model work is obviously getting those talented existing management to stay on board and to be incentivized to keep delivering excellence. So I'd be interested to hear about what have you learned about incentives? How do you structure the deals or, or, or maybe just like the, yeah, how do you set things up to make sure that the people who are running the business are incentive and incentivized and motivated uh -huh. to keep on delivering excellence? Yeah. What are your thoughts on incentives in general? Well, uh, well, I have many thoughts on incentives <laughs> and incentivizing people. I mean, uh, I mean, a hum human human being. I mean, we are, you know, we're. We're complex in some, you know, in some manners, but we are very simple in other parts, you know. And the simplicity in how to incentivize who we are. So, uh, so uh, you know, sticks and carrots. Uh, it's uh, if you perform well, you know, you have a very good upside. And if you perform worse, then um, and then we have the stick, uh, and uh, uh, and it works pretty well. So, for example, when we acquire business, you know, we are very generous in terms of. So we say that typically we say, okay, we buy your company, but we pay seventy percent now, and we pay thirty percent in three years, or. And that's our earnout structure. And an earnout structure can be we have three years. We have actually earnout structures up to ten years. Okay, and uh, we pay you seventy percent now. We pay you the rest thirty percent in ten years. But those thirty percent can be, you know, more than the first payment that you got, depending on how you deliver. So we are very generous on the upside, but we are very harsh on the downside protection. 
saying that if you drop, you know, if you make, I don't know, 2 million euro in profit, and if you have an average profit that is after three years, that is less than this, then we have a clawback and we can, you know, pay you nothing, for example, uh, depending on how it goes and so on. So, uh, which uh, we almost never had had to execute on the downside because people are so eager in not delivering, you know, bad results when they have very clear incentives in what is waiting them. So, uh, so it, uh, but that works well. And then, and then also there are other incentives in terms of, uh, for example, that uh, giving you autonomy. I'm not going to tell you who to hire or fire. You decide. I will not tell you and I will not, uh, you can, if you want our help, we will help you. But if you want to decide yourself, you decide yourself. Okay. And we don't, uh, so the autonomy, I think, is a very big incentive that we offer that many other, uh, many other business owners wouldn't. So, uh, and it is very much boiling down into, I think, a philosophy of how important it is in and how much power you really have in, uh, you know, the, the power that you can release, you can power that you can, uh, you can grow within an individual if you provide the right vessel. Yeah, the, you know, entrepreneurship is a core value at, at at your company. It's like you're 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 trying to create a system that allows the entrepreneurs to flourish. Yeah, essentially, right? I think that is also something that I mean, many people. Uh, I mean, if it's a private equity fund that is running, you know, and doing some acquisitions, typically, they there are people that went to business school and then they are sitting at you know some financial, you know, headquarter, whether it's in Helsinki or is it, it's in Stockholm or it's London. They are sitting with their Excel sheets, you know, number crunching. I mean, when it comes to, you know, for me, but not only me, my colleagues, most of them have uh, been building their own businesses, you know, successfully. And they have uh, been at some time maybe exited and selling their businesses to someone. So I would say that we are, we are company builders. We are, we are entrepreneurs at the core. And uh, our experiences in entrepreneurship makes us better investors, and our experience in, in invest investing makes us better entrepreneurs. And so, yeah, yeah. I think Warren had a quote exactly like that. Um, so, is there anything because you built companies and you've seen so many companies being built from the inside? Is there anything that you look at? Um, is there a kind of a qualitative analysis that you make in evaluating companies that someone who only looks at the spreadsheet might miss? Like, what are the things you look for that are just not purely quantitative financials? Uh, well, if we type, if we so so uh, resilience, resilience, resilience. That is what we are looking at. So, uh, businesses with great growth, that's good, okay, but. Uh, we want to have re resilient, reliable, long-term cash flow. And so we want to, you know, really be sure that we have a cash flow and we have a business and we are delivering a service or a product that is critical. And it doesn't matter if uh, Putin invading Ukraine or if it's a pandemic or whatever, you know, this... So, for example, we have a business in one of the companies that I started 10 years ago, uh, traffic light automation in Stockholm. You know, it needs to work. It doesn't matter if it's pandemic or not. It doesn't matter if it's... Uh, the, we have a war going on uh, in Ukraine. It doesn't... You know, it needs to work, you know? So it's a system-critical business. You're, or So that's that's... That's the core of, you know, we try to do all the way, all from the search that we do, trying to find businesses that have this kind of very sticky and very uh, 
reliable or resilient you know services or products uh, when we acquire them and making sure that the structure is in a way that there are good incentives in order to get it going in the same way and then the last part is you know how what is the next step for this business how can we take it to you know maybe we can take the same processes that we have here we are after a while we understand and we get better understanding of the business say wow this we can do not only in stockholm we can do it in this in many other cities you know and we can do it more efficient what are your thoughts when you look at a company and say let evaluate like future growth let's say for instance expanding geographically into into europe like how do you look at those things as like yeah how, how do you think about growth and and what what are the areas uh where you think where you typically see like, oh, this is an easy, this could be low hanging fruit. This is an easy way to grow. And what are some potential growth scenarios where you're like, ah, oh, that's probably a too risky, you know, when companies start talking about like new products or expanding into Germany, like how do you think about different growth avenues and the risk versus versus reward just in general? Well, I would say it's, uh, again, uh, very much having the empirical approach, you know, try small pieces, you know, Make some experiments. So if you want to go into a new jurisdiction, first of all, since we have businesses in different jurisdictions, uh, we say that, okay, we have a Polish IT business, for example. Say, And they are working in Poland, but they have a great product uh, and they have a great offering and they want to expand. Say, okay, l- let's see. We have businesses in the Nordics. We have business in UK. We have business in Spain. Uh, so we don't have so much in uh, in Germany. So let's let's try to in uh, Sweden, for example. Okay, we we tried two jurisdictions in a small way, in a small manner. Try to get attract five customers in Sweden and five customers in UK and see how it works. Okay, and we have companies working there, so you can talk to them, you can get help from them, you can exchange experiences. Mm, do it in a small you know, experiment uh, before you scale up. Uh, and then we will find out, uh, well, for some reason, no, this offering, it doesn't work in Sweden. It can be some regulatory issues or whatever, you know, that we didn't know before we get to, to start, you know. And and that's the thing. That's the empirical approach is so, you know, efficient because there are so many things that you can sit and you can read about it and you can but you don't really understand it in depth until you really do it, you know. That's that's why you can't you can't be a chemist by only reading chemistry books. You have to do the experiments. Then you will understand. Got it. Is there anything? Because presumably you've seen you know come across hundreds of Swedish and Nordic companies. Um, is there anything that you? that stands out in terms of a pattern of like, uh, you know, they're typically great at this, whether it's like the product, but they're typically lack like the sophistication when it comes to some other area. Is there any patterns in terms of, you know, what, what Nordic companies are good at? And Well, and, and first of all, first of all, you can't say Nordic companies. I mean, you can't trust the Danes. We all know that. <laughs> no, but, uh, but it's very different cultures. It is. I would say Swedish and Finnish corporate culture is quite similar, you know, and I think it come it goes back to, you know, it's really industrial nations. You have to plan for something, you have to, you know, develop some product and then you scale up and you have a factory and then you go and sell it while you know the Danes; they are they are always the middle hand, middleman. So you have to, you know, in order to make put food on the table for your family, you have to. There are coming pe- ships coming, you know, and you have to buy it cheap and sell it expensive. You know, that's the core of you know the business uh, culture. The Norwegians, fishermen, you know, so they have to go out, you know, to catch the. The, the fish of the day, you don't know what you get. Someday it's good, someday it's not good. Some t- some, sometimes you don't come back, you know. it's uh, Suddenly it's a storm and you don't come back. So Norwegians are much more cowboys <laughs> in that term, you know. 
Uh, so much more risk takers, I would say. So it is not, uh, Sweden and Finland is quite similar, but then I would say it's not, uh, um, what, what I experienced being a Swedish, you know, company, when we go to Spain, for example, or Poland, uh, we find out that, you know, the Spanish entrepreneur, they are very happy to sell to Swedes because we have a brand of being transparent and you can trust, you are trustworthy. And they trust more in Swedish people than they do in 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 Spanish people, you know. Uh, so uh, so it is a good it, it, it's it's a it's a good good uh, good brand or good uh, yeah uh, to to be Nordic. Uh, I don't think uh, the Spanish people can distinguish bet- so much between you know the Danish culture or Swedish and Finland Finnish culture, but. Uh, yeah, but there are some big differences, I would say. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Like that Nordic brand could really be an asset yeah, for when sure. you're thinking about yeah, yeah, yeah. going abroad. Yeah, for sure it is. Uh, yeah, but I'd be curious to, or, you know, imagine that there's someone listening to this podcast who has a business owner, or entrepreneur, who's looking to sell their company or, you know, thinking about selling their company maybe a few days, years down the line. Is there any advice you could give to this person of like, is there anything they can do today in order to prepare for it and and um, to make sure that the process, when it comes, if it comes, is as smooth and successful as possible? Like, is there something you've seen companies like, you know, you, you should really put these things in order because otherwise it's going to diminish the value of your company or it's going to make it harder to sell? I mean, uh, so for example, we tend to build our businesses. I mean, we have a like handful of larger uh, enterprises. uh, And I mean, they are privately hold, I mean, privately owned, but we, we try to implement processes as if they would be listed. So we have quarterly reports. uh, We, we get these things in order rather you know early uh, and I think it builds lots of value in the business because then you have to you know do things you know in a processed manner in a structured manner and um, it puts some costs and some you know tension in the organization but when they adapt to it then it's great you know it's uh, everybody understand that uh, well it's good that we did it so essentially Eager companies could benefit from maybe adding a little bit cost to creating, doing things in a bit more professional structure, yeah, systematic yeah, way. Building, you know, because you are building also, uh, you know, uh, you are building structured capital in your business, you know, so that someone is taking over the business, you know, they can do it without you. So you need to also do yourself more and more redundant. So I, I say, I mean, the best, the best business to buy is really profitable business, great business, and they're going like, you know, uh, but with a not so good entrepreneur. Because then you know that, okay, I will make it also. If uh, if it was done with a, with an average guy, then, you know, it's, so, so I'm very cautious, much very cautious when I meet, you know, a great entrepreneur, you know, because then I need to think, once or twice, what happens if this guy suddenly want to go sailing, you know, and not running the business? How dependent is the business on this guy? Uh, so, and that's difficult to understand, you know, during a due, due diligence process of, uh, you know, six weeks. You, need, you you try to understand that for over a six-week period. It's difficult. So, um Yeah. So that's a bit counterintuitive is that being a great entrepreneur may not even lead to like the, the great business outcome in terms of when you want to sell your company. <laughs> of course, of course. But uh, having an external CEO perhaps at a certain stage, at that stage, you know, it's difficult to say when and so on. I mean, if I, I would rather buy a business that I see, oh, this is a great business and very profitable, strong cash flow, with an external CEO and the owner of the business 
he's coming to the company every six months. You know, that's a great business to buy, okay? Because I'm buying from someone and I know that guy is not going to be crucial to the business. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, I know you're a busy man, so I'm you know, going to let you go here in just a minute. But one last question for you. You're someone who thinks a lot about thinking, about kind of frameworks and understanding the world. So I'd be curious to know, what are you paying attention to right now? Let's say I'm going to give you a caveat, which is you can't say AI because everyone else says <laughs> everyone knows about AI. But is there anything that you're looking at and you think, wow, this is really interesting? Could be business, science, anything that you're kind of paying attention to? Uh. Well, I mean, there are so many low-hanging fruits. Uh, you know, people are suddenly, oh, uh, blockchain, AI, I don't know what kind of bu buzzword uh, you want to use. Uh, I mean, blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, you know, this is my business. And then, you know, suddenly everybody is interested. No, we don't do that because it's so difficult to foresee how the future will look like and so on. So we try to position ourselves in a way that uh, whatever technology comes, you know, we are going to be agnostic about it so that we can take that technology using it for... So uh, so there are so many low-hanging fruits, so we don't tr we don't do this kind of analysis that, well, that's, that's going to be the shit, you know, that's going to be the best thing to invest in. Rather, we see, you know, again, resilience, 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 you know. Uh, we don't want to go into a business where even if we see that the business is going like this, so I... I I mean, consumer products we don't go into. So as, as an example, Pokemon Go, you know, if someone would tell you uh, three months before it, you know, peaked, if someone would tell you, look, in three months from now, you will have adult people running around the town finding Pokemon through their uh, smartphones, you would say you're delusional, okay? And then, you know, it peaked and... And I thought that, wow, this is going to be a revolution in augmented reality and, you know, everything. This is the, 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 the tipping point. And at that stage, if someone would tell you in three months from now, this will be gone, you wouldn't believe it. You would say, no, you're delusional. This is here to stay, you know. But three months later, it was gone. So it's so difficult to see, you know, the trends and where are we going in the... On long term, you can see. On shorter term, it's very difficult. So, so uh, we try to not speculate on that, and really stick to the core, which is resilience, resilience, resilience. Strong, reliable, long term cash flow. That's it. So yeah, I think there's this uh, Lindy principle or Lindy effect where the longer something has been around, the more likely it is to be around in the future. Okay, yeah. uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. So like relying on yeah, that seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Why speculate about yeah, something yeah. where you can do something <laughs> that's yeah. Um, Said, so it's been a real real treat and a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very um, much. For people who want to follow you and what you're doing, you're thinking about <laughs> no bullshit and, uh, and other ideas about ideas um, what's the best way is LinkedIn LinkedIn where you're most uh, well, I don't have any Instagram or any other uh, uh, social media so LinkedIn is the only one that I use so you will find me on LinkedIn and uh, you can follow my both business wise but also some other thoughts that I publish sometime perfect we're going to put the link in, in, in the show notes um, yeah thank you so much for coming on um, I hope you have a great rest of the day thank you very much thanks for having me on the podcast Thank you for listening. You can find all episodes of The Growth Pod on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts.